Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a great honor for me to be the moderator of this session today, where we have three worldwide and very famous speakers who knows a lot about the topic today, the resonance frequency analysis. I am professor at the dental faculty in Copenhagen, where we have worked experimentally and also clinically with our STEL equipment. Actually, we use it on a daily basis with our students, and they like it very much. But today we have to hear about the research behind it and all the experiments, or at least some of the experiments, which have been done with this fantastic system. And one of the inventors of the systems, or researchers behind it, together with Neil Mary, did I think, is Lars Senneby, who I have known for many years, and I look very much forward to your, I would call, a little bit historical uh, presentation of the system. So please, Lars, <laughs> we'll give him a hand. So, good morning. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, today we're celebrating 20 years with uh, resonance frequency analysis. And I've been uh, on the journey, so to say, for 20 years. So what I would like to do as a little introduction to uh, Dr. Van den Bogard and Peter Moy uh, is to discuss the history of, of the system and then to make some, some claims about the technique. Today, commercially, this is known as OSTEL. Underlying technique is resonance frequency analysis. And I would like to do some statements before we start here. This is a non-invasive implant uh, technique for implant stability measurements. And we know now from 20 years of use and research that it gives relevant information about the state of the implant bone interface at any time point uh, during the treatment and follow-up of, of the patients. The question is, what should we have the technique to? Can we use it for something? Well, we can use it to monitor integration, as we will beautifully see in the coming presentations. We can use it to decide when to load our implants. We can use it to avoid failures. And finally, we can also uh, use it to diagnose uh, old cases that comes back to your office, the patient has a problem, it may be pain, swelling, whatsoever. With one measurement, you can actually tell if the implant uh, is still integrated and had, uh, have a good degree of uh, stability or not. So you can actually exclude disintegration of the implant in your diagnosis. So it all started with this guy, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Neil Meredith, who in 1992 got an idea. And at that time he was in Eastman Dental Institute in London. And the idea he got was from another part of uh, industry. And historically, tapping has been used to analyze the integrity of glass and metals. And by tapping on the glass, you will have a ringing sound and the different frequency of that ringing sound indicates different properties of the material due to cracks, impurities, and corrosion. So for instance, the integrity of train wheels are tested in this way by tapping the wheel, and if there is a high tune, high resonance frequency, we know that there is no uh, corrosion, no uh, uh, cracks, but if the resonance frequency is low, we know there's something wrong with the metal and the train wheel, which needs to be changed. So he thought that maybe we can use the same principle then to analyze the stability of dental implants in bone. So Neil is the inventor, but together with Professor Peter Corley. And Peter is at the Imperial College in London, and his speciality is vibration engineering. So these two guys meet, and they start to think about how to do measurements using resonance frequency analysis on dental implants. So they do some prototyping of transducers. They have to do a setup, of course, of electronics uh, to excite the transducers and to analyze their uh, resonance frequencies. And this is before mobile phones was a great product. This was before electronics were very, very small and fast. So it means that 
at that time, we were using quite big equipment, like an oscilloscope, a frequency response analyzer, and a huge PC. And this was the setup. And I met Neil in 1992, and we decided to work together. So we brought this machinery into the Bronemar Clinic, where I was working at the time. And on your right-hand side, you see a prototype of a transducer, which we used in patients. And one measurement could actually take five minutes in the patient. And in the first studies we published, we have quite a lot of patients with five to six implants, so we spent like a half an hour, 40 minutes, just to do the measurements in these patients. The principle at that time was to use an L-shaped transducer like this, and we have a cantilever beam uh, on the transducer here. And on each side of the cantilever beam, there is a piezo element. And by introducing a current into the piezo element, they will bend and stretch. In this way, the beam is excited and start to vibrate. And then we introduce a, a sinus wave of increasing frequencies. And at a certain point, the amplitude of the vibration will be as, uh, at its maximum, and that is called the resonance frequency. And we see a, 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 an example of such a curve, an amplitude frequency curve here. So that is the resonance frequency. And at this time, we were thus measuring implant stability in hertz or kilohertz. And, uh, as, we, as you know today, we're using another unit, the ISQ unit, so we're coming back to that. But this was the reality at this time. Neil moved actually to Sweden, and we worked together so much, so we decided to do this project as a PhD project, and he was actually my first PhD student. And in 1997, he defended this thesis, which included seven papers, it was like a proof of the concept, we had in vitro studies, we had in vivo studies, and some clinical studies, just to prove that it was possible to use this technique to measure uh, implant stability. And uh, the findings from this work was that resonance frequency analysis is sensitive to interfacial stiffness. So if we are looking at an implant, we have different stiffnesses, so to speak. We have the stiffnesses of the components themselves, and then we have the stiffness of the surrounding bone, that is the biomechanical properties of the bone. But in these systems, uh, system, the uh, uh, biomechanical properties of the components are, are constant, so it's actually changes and differences of the bone stiffness we are measuring with the technique. So this could explain why we could sometimes measure low resonance frequencies, and in other examples we could measure high resonance frequencies. What we also found out is that the resonance frequency analysis is um, sensitive to what we call effective length above the marginal bone crest. And this is an analogy with uh, if you're using a tuning fork, and if you uh, increase the length of the beams, the tune will, be, will become longer, uh, lower, the resonance frequency will decrease. So this means that if we have some kind of defect or marginal bone resorption around an implant, the resonance frequency will be lower as a physical effect since the beam, vibrating beam, is becoming longer. So it means that the technique is also sensitive to uh, identify um, marginal bone resorption. So the um, relation between stiffness and resonance frequency was first tested in vitro by placing an implant in light curing resin. And here we can see how the resonance frequency is increasing while the stiffness of the resin is increasing. And in this part we have actually a linear relation between the uh, uh, time and increase of resonance frequency. And this is the, um, showing the relationship between exposed implant height and resonance frequency. And here we have implant placed in an aluminum block at different heights above uh, the uh, aluminum block. And we also have a linear relationship here. In uh, 1996, we applied uh, for a so-called demonstration project to the European Commission. 
And the name of this project was Improving the Success Rate of Dental and Craniofacial Implants Using Resonance Frequency Analysis. And we got the money, 2.2 million euros. And this money was used to, uh, to induce a multicenter uh, clinical study in uh, Europe where we wanted to test the RFA technique under clinically realistic conditions. But the aim was also to develop the technique into a commercial available technique. So in 1999, the first company was uh, founded, that was Integration Diagnostics. And the inventors were um, uh, the owners together with other industrial partners, partners. During this European grant project, the technique was developed. And now we could make use of developments uh, you know, within the mobile phone technology. So instead of using the oscilloscope and frequency response analyzer, we could now uh, make this black box, which made uh, things much easier. But still, we needed a computer then to, um, to uh, read the measurements and make them into graphs. So this is the second generation of RFA measurement. And here we have the inventor doing a measurement on his former wife. This is, of course, a, a fake picture because she doesn't have any implants. Then we're entering the commercial era. And here we have the third hero. Um, uh, who has been involved in the development of the technique, and that is Anders Peterson. Uh, used to be the CEO of Integration Diagnostics, and now is the COO uh, of Ostel AB. And uh, Anders has been instrumental, I would say, for the further development of the technique. And uh, what we realized during the first era, using the first and second generation, was the problem with the transducers. Each transducer had its own fundamental and unique resonance frequency. So this meant that we had to calibrate each transducer. And then after the measurements, we have to add or retract Hertz in order to calibrate all the transducers. Another problem was that since we had to sterilize these transducers, they were uh, very brittle and broke often, as well as the calibration blocks broke. So we had a problem of keeping all the measurements on track. So there was a need of improvements in this sense. The next generation, the Ostel machine, um, made use of uh, calibrated transducers from the manufacturers. And we also introduced the ISQ unit. So instead of measuring in Hertz, we are now measuring in ISQ units. So when you do a measurement, you get a, a reading from 1 to 100, based on the underlying Hertz, but also based on the calibration on these kind of aluminum blocks. So it means that uh, now uh, measurements were directly comparable. With the wire technique, there were some... Um, uh, drawbacks. For instance, we could, in a single tooth uh, situation, only place the, imp uh, the transducer in bacolingual or bacopalatal direction. And we know from measurements we did in edentulous patients that if we are rotating the transducer, we can actually measure different stabilities in different directions. And usually the implant is more stable in mesial, mesial distal direction since we have more bone to support and we have less stability in buccolingual direction since often the bone is thinner. And with this technique we actually missed the higher stability in mesial distal direction. And at that time, recommendation was actually to place the transducer like that. So there was a need for, you know, um, developing the technique. And I think this was a really nice thing when Anders came up with the first generation, which is called the Ostel Mentor, where we were using a smart peg. And this is a small uh, peg which can be placed on any implant in any situation. And it's excited with electromagnetic pulses, and also the resonance frequency of the peg is measured with this transducer. And this transducer is actually vibrating in at least two different directions. So it means that it can measure the lowest and the highest ISQ in different directions. With the first instrument, uh, we had to do two measurements in order to pick up the two different 
uh, stabilities in different directions. So there was an, a, a need again then to develop this technique. And this is the instrument we're using today. That's the Ostel ISQ machine. And if there is a difference uh, between the lowest and highest ISQ um, um, uh, level, you will see that on the display as shown here. This is showing 57 and 68. So you have a low value and you have a high value. So uh, it's easier than to pick up. This is my personal uh, Ostel machine it's in Ferrari red. Do you like it, Leonardo? Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Then, what have we learned during the 20 years? Well, it's a very short presentation this morning, but I can do some um, conclusions. And we have also been writing uh, about this in this paper, which was published in 2008 in Periodontol uh, Periodontology 2000, which is a review paper on the technique. We know that implant stability can be measured then in different ways. It could be uh, in rotational stability, it could be axial stability, and, and it could be lateral stability. And we are actually measuring lateral stability with the Ostel technique. So imagine that we are pushing an implant with a certain force in a lateral direction. This means that the implant will move in the bone. There will be a, a different, a, a, some a degree of displacement. And when this load is taken off the implant, the implant will go back to its original uh, um, position. And this is different in different bone densities, for instance. So it means that a clinically stable implant actually exhibits mobility on the microscale when we do this kind of loading. So it means that a stable implant can actually display varying degrees of microstability depending on factors relating on the bone, surgical technique, and also the design of the implant. It is believed from the experiences with the implants, and we soon have 50 years of experience with OC integrated implants, that historically we have seen more failures with implants placed in soft bone, short implants, grafted bone, in situations where the biomechanics are somewhat compromised. So we believe that implants with risks for extensive micromotions in the bone bed are more prone to failures than more stable implants, so to say. So if the RFA technique now is measuring displacement, the technique can of course be used then to identify these implants and also to monitor development of implant stability after implant placement. So we did a simple in vitro measure, um, um, investigation, where we placed the implants into bovine bone specimens with uh, cone beam CT. We could measure Hounsfield units around the implants, and then we measured uh, with the ISQ technique, and also we measured displacement. So we actually pushed the implant with 25 newtons for two seconds, and then we could measure how much the implant was displaced in the bone, and then we correlated this with the ISQ technique. And we see that it's a very nice um, correlation between displacement and measurement with ISQ. So we can say that the ISQ technique is actually reflecting the micromobility of the implant in the bone bed. And the factors deciding then how much the implant is displaced or the ISQ value is the degree of bone density and how well the implant is uh, then engaged with that bone uh, density. So it's again all about bone density, surgical technique, and the implant design. We can also conclude that high ISQ values reflect high stability and successful implants. We have seen that increasing ISQ values reflect a successful integration process, irrespective of which level we start. So the interesting part when using OSTEL measurements is the low uh, ISQ values, let's say below 60. And they may reflect low stability, they may reflect the presence of a marginal, marginal defect or marginal bone resorption, and falling ISQ values may reflect an ongoing failure. So let's say we start on 60, and then we see with time a slow decrease to 55 to 50. This is probably a sign of an ongoing failure. 
It could also be a sign of ongoing bone loss since there is a geometrical relation between the distance from the top of the uh, smart peg to the first bone contact. And in cases where we start with very high stability, let's say 80, 85 ISQ, we can see a decrease due to ongoing remodeling, but then there will be a flatten out effect around 70, 75. That is not an ongoing uh, um, failure. So I think all these factors will be discussed by the uh, coming presenters. And this is just a summary of the model, how we are thinking when using OSTEL measurements. So this is day zero when we place implants, and we will see different degrees of implant stability, maybe from 55 up to 85. That's quite normal depending on bone density and so on. With time, we will see changes of the uh, ISQ value. For implants with low stability, usually we like to see an increase with time, if we have very high stability when we place the implant, it's not unusual that we see a decrease. And it seems like all implants are actually striving against uh, an ISQ about 70, 75 after completed healing. And of course, inside this diagram, if we have implants going like that, that is a risk behavior, and then we have to cope with that. And I think Dr. van den Bogarden will discuss that. And finally, I would like to uh, say a big thank you to the heroes of resonance free Sequence analysis. We have the inventors, uh, Professor Meredith, Professor Corley, and we also have Anders Pettersson. So thank you very much for listening to me. I would also like to thank uh, Lars very much for this very fantastic uh, presentation and introduction of the system. And now we go to an Italian guy who has worked with it for many, many years in private practice. Please, Leonardo van der Bogart. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to share with you my experience with uh, resonant frequency analysis as a diagnostic and prognostic support uh, in uh, immediate function. You know that uh, uh, when you place uh, an implant, you have a mechanical anchorage in bone, and the, the primary stability, and this uh, primary stability tend to um, very often tend to decrease, and uh, after which uh, we have uh, the anchorage in bone is ensured by secondary stability. And the resonance frequency analysis is a method to measure the implant stability over the healing period. When you place an implant according to immediate function procedure, it's crucial to know what happened to this implant during the healing. Uh, luckily, in most cases, we have a, a behavior like this. After a while, the ice cube curve tend to increase reaching the safety zone. But at some time, you can have a curve like this that fall into the failure zone. So if you detect the ice cube stability, the ice cube value during the healing, you are able to intercept a possible failure. This is the first version of the hostel that shows some, uh, some drawbacks. Uh, now we have this uh, very a reliable instrument, wireless, um, give a two-direction recording and a very careful measurement. I finalized uh, for uh, immediate function studies, and I, in the last two, we use uh, systematically the RFA as a monitoring system. Uh, we are also two um, studies in progress. The question is, the RFA is a, an option or an essential system of the evaluation? In my opinion, the RFA is a useful method in many clinical situations. But uh, there are some clinical conditions where the RFA is essential for the success of the therapy. And I try to identify this uh, condition, the immediate function. The immediate function on implant place into fresh stretch and sockets. In the media function combination with GBR, 
in media function in upper incisor area, very risk area in my experience. And uh, you can also use RFA for implant rescue. This uh, is a study published two years ago in early function on a NEOS implant, and we use RFA measurement at different interval times. This is the clinical protocol of this study, with no time to describe it. And this is the ice cube curve during the healing. And you can notice this drop of stability after four weeks. That uh, this outcome has been reported by, the, uh, by other authors. Another study that we published a few years ago was on uh, immediate function on uh, implant placed into directly into fresh stretch and socket. And we did some measurement at different uh, interval times. And the clinical protocol immediate extraction, bone graft, and uh, temporary prosthesis. And we found that uh, a group of patients show a maintenance of stability, another group show an uh, increase of stability during the time, and another group an initial drop and then a maintenance over the time. Uh, the immediate function in combination with GBR is uh, one of the most challenging situation. Look at uh, this case to, to Chief in the upper jaw, replaced by implant, and you can see the ice cube value at this, this implant. The first one is very stable, the other one is, has a demonstrated borderline value of ice cube. So I applied the regenerative procedure with bone graft, a resorbable membrane, uh, immediate impression, and temporary bridge application. And, uh, after six months, this is the re-entry surgery. If you compare it uh, with the baseline uh, made, you can see the completely coverage of the exposed part of the implant. It is interesting to notice what happened from the ice cube point of view. There is a maintenance of stability over the first four weeks, and then the stability tended to increase continuously up to six months. The upper incisor area, in my experience, is one of the most risky situations because of the clusal trauma. So it could be very important to monitor the implant stability. It's a one is two temporary crown and the final restoration. And these are the ice cube curves of the two implant. And it is very important that uh, these uh, curves remain inside of the sort of the safety area. If you notice uh, that uh, this, uh, one of these curves tended to decrease uh, continuously, you have uh, to remove uh, uh, from the occlusion. And uh, this one of the most uh, interesting application of the RFA. The, you can, uh, uh, using RFA in systematic way, you can intercept uh, a failure. Look at this implant. It looks good, but if you observe what happened to the ice cube curve, you notice a continued decrease of the stability up to the six weeks when the ice cube reached the failure zone. So I remove the loading, modified the temporary restoration, and you can see after at the six month, the implant re recovered completely the stability and even overcome the initial value. Another case in the upper jaw, a central incisor fracture, immediate, immediate installation of an implant, long implant, and a short crown to avoid any possible trauma in uh, occlusion. And uh, in spite of this, uh, the stability tend to decrease continuously up to four weeks when the stability reached a sort of a threshold and start to enter in the failure zone. So I unload the implant, wait for an additional two months, and when the implant reached a sufficient stability, I reload the implant. 
And you can notice that at the six month, the implant gain more and more stability. And from the soft tissue and hard tissue point of view, the result is very satisfying. And this is the protocol that I adopt in the media function procedure. I uh, place the threshold of T55, and uh, if uh, we have a value below this uh, threshold, I do not load. If uh, it can include between 55 and 65, I check the implant every week. And uh, above 65, I check the implant every two weeks. If you adopt this uh, protocol, you can, you have able to, uh, to intercept a curve like this and adopt a rescue uh, procedure. I very, very briefly show you a couple of studies that we are uh, carrying out. The first one is a comparative study between uh, two implant surfaces. One uh, uh, proactive is a rough surface compared to the other one, two extraction sites and uh, two implant in place, in place, and bone graft, immediate placement of the restoration, temporary restoration. And uh, this uh, preliminary result showed this, uh, that uh, with the proactive, uh, we have uh, probably less uh, drop of stability compared to bimodal. And the buccolingual duration, higher value with proactive than the bimodal. Another study that uh, we are carrying out is uh, uh, the immediate function or a small diameter neos implant in a static area. This is a typical uh, situation uh, frontal uh, lower incisor rim, mm, affected by periodontal disease, uh, immediate placement of two implants, uh, and uh, uh, temporary restoration, a uh, final restoration. And the single, uh, another case, a single tooth replacement. And these are the preliminary data, and then they show you this uh, uh, kind of drop of stability at uh, two weeks. And it's very interesting that uh, notice that the baseline value is uh, comparable with uh, uh, achieved with the uh, uh, standard four diameter implant. And uh, to finish my presentation, I would like to show you a new project, a new idea for the use of the RFA nerve function, the application of full load after six weeks of healing using the RFA as an evaluation system. Normally, we can use the delay loading. We wait three, four months uh, because, uh, after application of full load. And, or we can use the immediate function. We can apply uh, the temporary restoration of the, the surgery, but uh, usually I, we don't load it. My idea is to use uh, to load, uh, to use the full load after six weeks using uh, RFA as a monitoring system. Why six weeks? Because uh, uh, if you place an implant, uh, normally you have an inflammatory response and then a bone deposition. Abramson has studied from the histologic point of view what happened around the implant during the healing, and we found that uh, between two and four weeks, the primary bone spongiosa were replaced with the lamellar bone. So we, if you place, uh, uh, load after six weeks, uh, probably you have uh, um, the surrounding bone, or um, the, the, the bone surrounding the, the implant is mainly formed by uh, lamellar bone. In addition, uh, you, uh, at the six weeks, uh, you overcome the critical period of three, four weeks uh, when we know that uh, um, very often the stability tends to uh, decrease. And this is a, a clinical case. I show you very, very briefly. Defestration and immediate installation of the conical implant. And we, this is the, the smart peg to do the measurement. 
in two orthogonal direction. You can see very, very high values. And uh, to summarize the clinical protocol, at day zero, we placed uh, a teeth restoration, implant installation, impression, and temporary bridge. And then we monitor the, the implant stability every week. And after four weeks, we try the bridge and the occlusion. And at, four, at the six weeks, we apply the final restoration with the full load. And then you continue to monitor uh, the implant. It's very important at this uh, the ice queue um, curves of these uh, cases, it's very important that uh, the RFQ curve remain above a security level. If you notice that one of these curves tended to decrease, you have to remove the, uh, the occlusion, the bridge from the occlusion. It is very also important to, to check the behavior of the RFQ curve. Sometimes the curve is maintaining during the time. Sometimes you have a curve like this, a drop and a recover, and sometimes continuous decrease. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leonardo, for this very illustrative uh, presentation here. Um, it, it is so that uh, after the three presentations, we will have time for questions also for Leonardo and uh, Lasse. But before this, we will go to our last uh, speaker of this session. And I think you're most of you know Peter Moy from UCLA University, professor at the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, who is also one of the first <laughs> who actually worked with this system, and I look very much forward to his presentation. So <coughs> please. Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to present to you this morning on 20 years with Austell, from the first human trial to a global standard. I was asked to uh, present to you this topic on establishing predictable surgical and restorative protocols through long-term tracking of ISQ data. As Vanden has very well covered with you, the initial protocol for os integration was a two-stage approach, whereby the implant that was placed is permitted to heal. And this healing period took a specific period of time, typically uh, not more than, rather not less than three months. But more recently, what we are seeing or uh, performing in our clinical practices is to not wait that minimum of three months and proceed with loading, oftentimes, as already was mentioned, early loading or possibly immediate loading. And so uh, I think that uh, Dr. Centerby's uh, concept of os integration being a continuum or a concept of stability is a good thought process to keep in mind when we're performing implant dentistry. Now, just eight years ago, we presented our first result as far as the use of the Ostel unit uh, to allow us to uh, predict, hopefully, the long-term success of the implant that we just placed. And I know that there's a lot of verbiage on here, so the important thing really is to understand the um, predictive value of that resonance frequency analysis. And the predictive value of when we perform a one-stage placement, which is to place the implant and connect a transmucosal attachment or connector to that implant versus two staging, which is to bury the implant. We would also like to see the predictive value of RFA in selecting loading protocols. As you saw uh, with our previous speaker, uh, there are many studies going on that looks at early loading uh, whereby the implant is uh, loaded with a prosthetic uh, uh, crown or restoration uh, after 
four to six weeks. And what we're really looking for is the cutoff value or the cutoff number that we see when we take our ISQ measurement. And so from that initial study, you can see uh, very clearly that depending on the loading protocol and depending on the placement protocol, we do see some significant uh, failures with a specific uh, approach. So when we looked uh, over eight years ago at the, the efficacy of using an ISQ number of 50 as the cutoff number, here are the results that we see as far as the uh, one stage versus two stage technique as well as immediate loading. When we look at these numbers specifically, what we're seeing is the fact that uh, with a two-stage technique, uh, the success rates for those implants are very high compared to a one-stage technique uh, when the ISQ uh, measurements were below 50. However, uh, when we look at the uh, ISQ values above uh, 50, you can see that the results are far better from the standpoint of uh, traditional loading. Now that was reported uh, almost uh, five years ago uh, with the first uh, Ostel Symposium at the EAO. What we also reported on in 2008 using that same information was that the uh, success rate of a one-stage implant with ISQ value of greater than uh, 50 at the time of placement was 97.8%. The success rate of a one-stage implant with ISQ value less than 50, as you can see, was 82.4. So there was a statistical significance. Uh, success rate of two-stage implants with ISQ values less than 50 at time of placement was 100%, indicating to us that what Professor Bronemark initially recommended uh, was truly good for the implant and osteointegration, uh, even if the uh, stability of that implant at the time of placement was low. So interpreting this data, our recommendations at that time in 2008 was to uh, two-stage the implant, bury it or cover it uh, if the ISQ measurement was below 50. And if it was between 51 to 60, we would consider one-staging it by placing a healing abutment or a transmucosal abutment through the implant, but not loading it. And if the ISQ value is higher than 61, we would consider immediate loading with a provisional restoration. Now again, that was in 2008, and to try to develop an algorithm for handling or managing immediately loaded implants, our thought was in the completely edentulous cases, because of the ability to use the provisional restoration to cross arch splint or stabilize all implants, uh, we would be able to provide a um, fixed provisional restoration on those implants regardless of the ISQ value. However, in the completely edentulous, if we are going to use the implants as a single unit, then it, uh, it is determined by the ISQ value uh, that if it was below 50, we would two-stage it or bury the implant. And if it was greater than 50, we would connect some sort of attachment to those single individual units uh, to support an overdenture situation. In the partially dentated, uh, we, we came up with a different algorithm because number one, oftentimes we do not have the capabilities of cross arch stabilization. Uh, and many of our partially dentated patients received CT scans. And as you saw uh, with Professor Centerby's presentation, uh, there is a correlation between ISQ value and the Hounsfields measurement uh, adjacent to the implant. 
Therefore, based on the CT scan measurements or as far as bone density, if the Hounsfields units in the area where we were planning to place the implant was less than 500, and the ISQ value when the implant was seated was less than 45, uh, we would definitely two-stage that implant. If the Hounsfields measurements were greater than 500 in the area where we were planning to place the implant, and we had variable ISQ values between 45 to 50, we would consider one staging or placing a transmucosal abutment. Finally, if the Hounsfields unit measurements were greater than 500 and ISQ values greater than 50, uh, we would consider immediately prov provisionalizing that implant or implants with a provisional restoration. Finally, for a single missing tooth, again, this was in 2008, uh, oftentimes in the aesthetic zone, we would not uh, obtain a CT scan. Therefore, in, in that period, we would be looking at insertion torque. And again, trying to develop an algorithm by which we can uh, make clinical decisions, the insertion torque value, if it was less than 25, and the ISQ value was less than 45. That is, if it did not take a lot of torque to seat that implant, indicating that the bone site was uh, quite soft bone, we would two-stage that implant. If the insertion torque uh, was uh, uh, equal to 35 newtons centimeters and the ISQ value ranged from 45 to 50, uh, we would one stage with a healing abutment. And if the insertion torque was greater than 35 and ISQ value greater than 50, again, we would consider immediate provisionalization. Now, selecting that uh, ISQ value of 50 as a cutoff value, what we were seeing were some is issues as far as uh, um, observing uh, some failures uh, with this algorithm. And as you can see, if we're not following that algorithm or protocol, uh, it results in a failure of the uh, immediate provisionalized implants. And to kind of um, give some credence to the recommendations that we've made. Uh, we went back again to these CT scans and evaluated the uh, Hounsfield's measurements uh, with uh, where the implants were positioned. And again, similar to what Professor Senevi showed you, uh, we were able to identify the specific risk factors that were associated uh, with the implant that failed and that is the Hounsfield's measurements uh, was quite low. Now, we received quite a bit of, uh, I wouldn't say criticism, but recommendations that it's not appropriate to just select a number uh, from the ISQ scale. And so what we did was we went back and looked at all of these uh, measurements and applied the um, equation for evaluating the sensi sensitivity and specificity uh, of these values. And as you can see, with any evaluation or exam, the sensitivity of that exam uh, includes all of the potential true values. But be because of the all-inclusiveness of this evaluation, there are some false positives. Therefore, we should have also apply an uh, equation for evaluating specificity where we would be able to rule out all of the false positive results, therefore uh, making the evaluation much more sensitive. So when we went back and looked at these numbers as far as one staging versus two staging, again, the key areas that show up was that now, instead of just handpicking uh, the value of uh, 50, uh, the equation looked at every single measurement. And so we were able to see that if values were less than uh, 55 as far as ISQ measurement compared to greater than 55, you see a significant improvement as far as uh, success rates for concern with these implants. And so back in 2008, I reported at the uh, EAO symposium, again, the placement protocol 
for sensitivity and specificity looking at a cutoff value of 55. And you can see that with sensitivity, it was measured at 0.85 and specificity 0.5, indicating a good evaluation as far as the cutoff number of 55. When we looked at loading techniques, again, it stood out quite clearly that the cutoff value of 55 uh, did indeed pick up uh, some of the uh, true, rather the true uh, false positives, uh, where you can see the survival of uh, implants uh, with even with traditional loading uh, was quite low. So, looking at the uh, scale, uh, the actual uh, area under the curve, as we call it, the cutoff value of 55 for loading protocol. Uh, was uh, sensitivity 0.96 and specificity 0.52. Again, improving, I think, on the predictive value uh, of the cutoff number of 55. Now, in 2010, we looked at those numbers again and to try to uh, get to an even more uh, predictable ISQ number. And we looked again at one staging versus two staging, early loading versus traditional loading. So with this evaluation, we looked at 713 implants at the time of placement. 425 were placed in the maxilla, 288 in the mandible. Of the implants that were analyzed for loading, uh, 1,257, Again, the majority of those implants were placed in the maxilla. Uh, 556 were placed in the mandible. And what we looked at was the receiver operating characteristics, in other words, the uh, true value of that statistical analysis. Uh, we tried to identify what we call the optimal RFA cutoff value. And looking at the area under the curve, again, remember that any uh, measurement resulting in a 0.9 to 1 uh, was considered an excellent evaluation. 0.8 to 0.9 was good. 0.7 to 0.8 was fair, and so on and so forth. So in 2010, what we looked at was this area under the curve and identify a specific cutoff number of 56 for the placement protocol. Again, you can see that specificity uh, dropped down to 0.83 and sensitivity went up to 0.53. So with one stage placement, what we were looking at were these numbers again and evaluating the predictive value of a cutoff number below 56 and a cutoff value above 56. And again, you can see the uh, significant results that were uh, obtained by increasing that number from 55 to 56. Uh, and it was different for the maxilla versus the mandible. And as you can see, there was a bigger swing or change uh, with the mandibular um, analyses versus the maxilla. When we combine all of it together, we see that an ISQ value below 56 resulted in a survival percentage of 86.7. However, with uh, a number above 56, that implant would provide us with a survival rate of 98.8 with one stage placement. Now, when we look at two stage placement, again, here are the values. Under 56, 100%. Above 56 was not as good as far as the values were concerned, 96%. Uh, in the maxilla, it was the uh, reverse. So as we always say in statistics, you can kind of throw the numbers together and uh, come about with a result that would uh, support your, your position. And that's what we did. We combined the, the, the values and came out with a 
96.6% survival with ISQ numbers below 56 and 98.1% uh, survival with ISQ greater than 56. And this is for two-stage placement. And the benefit of this is that what we're doing is we're able to follow our patients for a longer period of time uh, and therefore we're able to see or pick up um, uh, failures that occur uh, out long term. So with this new cutoff number of uh, 54, we see that the, as far as loading is concerned, the specificity is again up to 0.95 and sensitivity has dropped down to 0.48. As far as early loading, uh, again, we saw the similar type of response uh, with our um, ISQ value cutoff number of 54. Um, again, combining the two, you're seeing 86.7 and 98.6 when the cutoff value was 54. Now, a lot of numbers here, but uh, it's going to lead up to the uh, discussion that I have for you after this presentation of uh, um, statistical analysis that indicates to me what we need to do when we see an ISQ value. So with traditional loading, when you compare or combine the two um, maxilla and mandible, you see that with a cutoff value of 54 now, uh, the survival rate is 82.6, and uh, with a cutoff value above 54, it was 98.9 uh, for traditional loading. From that, the conclusion was that the RFA is a reliable method for determining placement and loading protocols. At that time, in 2010, our cutoff value for placement was 56. That will help me to decide whether I can one-stage the implant or bury it and um, allow for a healing period. For loading, the cutoff value was 54. The RFA strongly predicts implant survival regardless of the implant being placed in the maxilla or mandible. And with two-stage placement, the survival for implants with ISQ values below the cutoff uh, was almost as high as implants with values above the cutoff. Again, indicating or supporting the fact that when, what we saw in the um, uh, 2008 report uh, implants at highest risk for failure were thus given the opportunity to integrate undisturbed when we buried that implant. So the same algorithm uh, was used and basically all we did was change the number or the cutoff value uh, from 50 to 54 for individual units in the completely edentulous cases and 56 uh, if we were going to consider immediately um, uh, loading uh, with an attachment. Again, we continue to use the Hounsfield's measurements for, for the partially dentated, uh, along with the cutoff value now of 54, if we're going to two-stage. If we're going to consider one-staging, we would uh, use the Hounsfield's measurement, uh, again, with uh, ISQ values between 54 and 56. And finally, uh, we have to achieve an ISQ value of 56 or higher if we're going to consider immediate provisionalization. With a single missing tooth now, uh, we, I have found that the insertion torque value really doesn't lend to uh, predictability, so we're uh, limiting our evaluation now to just the use of the ISQ number. Uh, with less than 54, I would two-stage it between 54 to 56, uh, staging with a healing abutment, and then greater than 56, immediate provisionalization. So, giving you kind of a uh, advanced look at what we're going to be presenting uh, at the uh, 28th Academy, uh, uh, Academy of Austin Integration meeting uh, coming up in uh, 2013, we looked at the same numbers again and tried to even develop a further, um, uh, more substantive uh, cutoff value. So 
here we had a few drop out from the initial study, so there were 703 implants reported on for placement, again the majority being placed in the maxilla, and now 1,254 implants for loading purposes. So again, a few of our patients have dropped out of that study. We're looking at the same type of receiver operating characteristics, and here, as you can see, with one stage placement, uh, a total of, uh, out of a total of 439 implants, 11 failed for a survival rate of 97.5% while two staging it, uh, six failed out of 258. Again, very similar uh, survival rate results for a combined of uh, 97.6. And when we look at the uh, loading characteristics, again, with early loading, four failures occurred out of uh, 406 implants for a 99% survival uh, versus traditional loading, 98% uh, survival with 17 failures combined for 98.3% survival. Essentially, what this means is that it's a continuum that we're seeing. And if we look at these cutoff values and the survival, uh, you can see that we're getting increasingly closer to identifying a cutoff value if you want 100% survival of 67. Now, when we look at uh, the loading group, again, looking at sensitivity and specificity, we're seeing again the 100% uh, range at an ISQ cutoff value of 67. So what we're hoping to present there uh, at the 28th annual meeting is that the, again, RFA value is a reliable measurement for implant stability and correlating that implant to survival based on loading and placement protocols. The increasing ISQ values correlate to increasing sensitivity in detecting an implant failure. Uh, all implant failures occurred at ISQ values below uh, 66 at placement and 67 for loading. In the placement group, implants with ISQ values less than 50 showed higher survival rates with two staging versus one staging. So what we're trying to achieve is really a cutoff value uh, with high sensitivity, uh, minimizing false negatives, and implants with ISQ values below the cutoff can survive if you take appropriate measures. So the Uh, this was the video that was supposed to be uh, played. I'm sorry um, for this uh, technical problem. Uh, the canine here has to be removed because of uh, internal root resorption, and the patient was becoming symptomatic. And again, this patient's demand uh, was for a uh, immediate uh, crown to be placed because of the uh, location of this tooth being in the aesthetic zone and her needs to uh, see her clients, her patients. And so with the removal of the canine, uh, the goal is to minimize trauma to the site, uh, minimize soft tissue reflection so that we are able to um, uh, maintain the connective tissue that is present around this tooth. And so you can see the gentle removal of the canine. And here you can see uh, no internal resorption, but on the other side, as you'll see here, uh, right at the cervical margin of the root, uh, the uh, internal resorption that was occurring. So we want to make sure that uh, any of that granulation tissue that is responding to the uh, internal resorption is removed, and the preparation of the implant site. Uh, for me, the goal to achieve stability or initial stability of that implant is uh, starting the preparation or the osteotomy 
along the palatal shelf or palatal vault. And as you can see, going through the preparation of the site, uh, the second key for uh, early or initial stability is creating that shoulder with your twist drills so that the implant, when it's placed, uh, is able to be uh, secured onto, again, that palatal shelf. And as you can see, we're preparing it with a tapered twist drill, uh, and then further uh, preparing the site now with the drill extension because the handpiece was hitting the adjacent tooth. Now, when I remove the handpiece and you see that twist drill stays in the site, uh, you know you'll be able to establish uh, appropriate and proper initial stability. Uh, here I'm just measuring the defect uh, and proceeding to add uh, augmentation material uh, specifically out to the labial. Uh, this is an alloplast material. Uh, any of the uh, alloplastic graft materials will do. Uh, once I have grafted the labial, I'll take the twist drill and place it back into the site so that I, when I'm further grafting uh, along the cervical margin, uh, I don't push this material down into the prepared site. So once I'm done uh, augmenting, I'll remove the uh, twist drill and place the implant in directly. This also uh, helps to avoid compacting the uh, graft material into the inner uh, aspects of the implant. Again, I typically insert this at about 35 Newton centimeters and I'll let the handpiece come to a full stop on its own right there before finalizing the seating or the positioning of that implant. I like to uh, seat the implant no more than three millimeters below the margin of the gingival tissue. Here we're taking our ISQ measurement and as you can see, the number of 73 indicates a very good initial stability, and I feel confident that uh, my prosthodontist will be able to provisionalize. So we put in a, um, a permanent abutment, uh, seat it, and then when we go to tighten the abutment screw, you want to put counter rotation on this because at the initial placement, you don't want to over torque and perhaps loosen or seat that implant deeper. And so I'll hand tighten the abutment screw, take a hemostat, and give uh, some resistance to this torque of the abutment screw. Because the one thing you do not want occurring when you're provisionalizing is that abutment screw loosening with time. Uh, because, as was pointed out already, um, the critical period, I feel, and I agree with uh, our previous speaker, that um, the critical period is really the first four weeks. So now I complete the augmentation uh, procedure by uh, using a collagen-based matrix. This is called plug uh, around the uh, neck of the implant, and to avoid uh, causing problems with the suturing uh, for my restorative uh, referral, I'll just throw a uh, horizontal mattress suture on the mesial, uh, as you can see, and then a horizontal mattress suture on the distal. Uh, that way they'll be able to apply the provisional restoration. Uh, just completing the suturing. and then going to the distal. Now you can see the collagen matrix absorbing the blood, uh, therefore helping us to stabilize the blood clot, especially around the cervical margin uh, of the uh, restoration that will be placed. So we'll finish suturing, and if there's excess collagen material, it's okay because uh, it will uh, resorb over time anyways. So now you can see the contours and marginal adaptation of the gingival tissue uh, around that implant that is just placed and the effect of the uh, augmentation. This was the patient one week later uh, for follow-up and you can see the healing progress uh, is uh, uh, undisturbed and proceeding adequately. At four months, I'll go ahead and remove this provisional restoration and remove the abutment. 
again, I feel that it's critical not to disturb this entire uh, area uh, as it's going through the healing process. This is the contour of the provisional crown. You can see the maturation of the soft tissue. And here, when we remove it, again, apply resistance with a hemostat uh, as, you, as you're loosening the abutment screw. Again, because you're not sure where the healing process is with that implant. It could be progressing very nicely or it could be uh, heading into the da danger zone. And so the initial measurement, as you saw, was 73. Uh, now at four months, we'll take a second reading and it goes to 79. That tells me two things. Number one, osteointegration is proceeding and that implant is holding up to whatever forces that are generated uh, on that uh, implant during function. And so we go ahead and seat the abutment back in, again, torque tightening it with a resistance, uh, counter resistance, uh, up to uh, now uh, 28, 30 newtons centimeters of force. And again, this is a, uh, quite an easy matter to perform. And as you can see, it really takes less than 10 minutes from start to finish to take that second measurement. And it's a valuable measurement to take because again, it allows you to track or follow uh, the rate of integration that is occurring. Now here you can see for follow-up at six months for the third ISQ measurement. Now here, if integration hasn't occurred, uh, we're in trouble. So uh, as you can see, we did not need to use the counter resistance. Uh, the third measurement, remember it went from 73 to 79. Um, it was 81. So you can, again, appreciate the fact that successive ISQ measurements allows you to uh, evaluate the um, progression of stability uh, with that implant. And at this point, uh, we will seat the abutment for the last time, therefore torquing it up to uh, 32 Newton centimeters, and then referring the patient over uh, for the definitive restoration which you see here. And obviously, uh, with the successive measurements, uh, the patient is awake, uh, no anesthesia is necessary, um, and we uh, are able to uh, provide our restorative doctor with a um, uh, definitive recommendation. So the importance of taking ISQ uh, measurements initially and then successive ones is that it establishes a baseline value for comparison to additional measurements after a healing period, additional subset of data or information to assist the clinician in determining the loading protocol. It confirms the phase of biologic osteointegration or lack thereof. It's a mean of communication with the restorative doctor as to when to proceed with the definitive prosthesis. And I would like to remind all of you remaining in the audience that the ISQ number represent a scale or a continuum and it's not an absolute number that uh, we need to, to try to identify. So with that, I thank you very much.